Uh, I grew up in Camino Island. It's like up north. Um, it's like a small kind of farm town. And there's not really a lot of style there at all. And so, and I don't know, I was just kind of a loner. My mom worked a lot and I was always like looking for something. And there was a lady actually that lived down the street, like in the same neighborhood. And she was like the only fashionable, she was like in her thirties back then, but she was the only like fashionable woman that I had known of. And she had like V magazine and like W magazine. And she did like fetish modeling in Seattle and like did a bunch of other stuff. And I just thought she was just so cool. And so, I don't know. And then um, my mom used to read, like the Inquirer, like the little soapy whatever magazine things. And so they'd have like the red carpet section in the back. And so I'd see like all these dresses and stuff and people all glammed up and like nobody that I knew around there like dressed like that. So uh, I, I first started, I, th I think I like safety pin stuff together. Like I didn't have a sewing machine and I used to go to the thrift store and like buy this, like the little thrift store that we had there on the island. And I'd buy, I don't know, like little scraps of fabric and like clothes and then I'd cut them up and remake them. And then like safety pins seams together. And I was trying to make my own stuff. And then um, when I was in, I think it was like sixth or seventh grade in middle school, I was in home ec. And my home ec teacher saw me like sketching like a outfit. And at that time we were sewing and learning how to make like teddy bears and like things like that. So she said if I stayed after class, after school, that she could teach me how to make a pattern. And they had like those big, huge paper roll things like in the hallway for like projects. So we just took one of those and it was just like a simple, like two piece pattern. It was like a strapless kind of like uh, dress and it was tight or whatever. So we just measured myself and then we divided it in half and then added like the, the bits for the seams. And so I kind of like took that and like started making my own stuff from there and like took that knowledge. And that's like the only formal I mean, it's not even formal. Like I said, it was like sixth, seventh grade, but that's the only like sewing training that I've ever had. And so I used to just, I don't know, I think I made like a Easter dress out of a pillowcase when I was like 14 and I got in my like boyfriend's car at the time and like the whole butt like ripped right out of it. And like, I immediately went back and changed, but I used to always wear my own clothes anyway. And just, I don't know, I just looked really different than everybody in my town. So like fashion's always been a thing for me. Since like really young. That's very, very uh, cool. Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I was just, that's like kind of the childhood aspect of like fashion for me. And then, I don't know, just, I was just like a teenage girl, 16, 17, 18, not really caring that much about fashion, more into like being an adult. And so I moved down to Seattle and cared about like, I don't know, going out and boys and stuff like that. And so when I got pregnant, when I was 23, is when things kind of like slowed down for me. And I was just like sitting at home all the time. And then I started picking up sewing again. Um, so I got a sewing machine and started making bikinis because I had a lot of friends that were like bikini baristas because that was when those were like popping up everywhere. And it was like the big thing around here. And so those girls like needed swimsuits like all the time, you know, because they always want like a new color, like a new thing. And then so I started making those. but it wasn't like simple swimsuits. They'd have like a bunch of intricate straps and it was kind of like right before all the strappy swimsuits were in, you know, like that's what I was doing back then. And so, uh, I looked up Seattle fashion week at the time, um, which was, it was going on back then. It was like 2010, I want to say. And then, so I emailed Seattle fashion week with my pictures, just like trying to get into something that has to do with fashion in Seattle. And then, um, he messaged me back and then we became good friends and he kind of helped me along to like meet people in Seattle. And I did like a small little show at like a bar where they were having like a thing and they needed a show there. And then I did one at um, iMusic when that was still around and then got into like chance fashion, which was like an underground thing kind of. And then just did some of those and just made like little collections here and there for quite a few years and built up my clientele and stuff like that. Uh, also, I forgot, I skipped a step, but when I was pregnant with my daughter and how I started getting my clients was I would make these bikinis and then I would drive around about her nap time. So it would be like noon or so. And I'd put her in the car in the back and I'd have all of my swimsuits or my outfits and accessories like in a suitcase in my seat. And then I'd have like, I'd take photographs at home and then just print them out like at Rite Aid or whatever and put them in like a little photo album. So I'd drive up to the coffee places and I'd get a coffee like my first one. And then I would give them the album and they would like look through it. And then I'd have all the outfits right here. So like I would just do that every day and drive around and get clients that way. So that was how I started kind of like selling stuff. And then I came up with the name Jersey Virago because I was born in New Jersey and it was like kind of a nickname of mine. 
And I always like words with like a V, like Vixen, or like when I was younger, I thought like Victoria, or like those, I don't know, those names were always cool to me. So I was looking actually in the thesaurus and found the word virago and then started looking more into that and it's like an aggressive like an overbearing aggressive woman and it's just like an old word um it was like from the uh, actual text from the bible but anyway it, it, it just meant a lot to me so i was like oh that's perfect so it was like it was uh, when i first started it was jersey's virago with an s because it was like me giving my virago to people like my style and like my energy kind of for this like kind of power girl type of thing and I eventually took off the ass because it just didn't make sense and everybody kept calling me jerseys when I was out and I'm like no my name's Jersey so I just took out the ass um but yeah so we got I started doing the fashion shows and then I reached out to well Seattle Fashion Week stopped right when I like right after that it had stopped for a few years and kind of went stagnant and then um Teresa picked it back up and they did Seattle Fashion Week again and had auditions for the designer whatever and so I brought my swimsuits in there and I had never done like a big fashion week only like small little collections and so they liked my stuff and decided to let me do Seattle Fashion Week and then that was my first like big collection and that's where I had met you was when I did like the stripey collection with like the neon kind of harnesses and stuff and that was my first kind of big like more like swimwear like just kind of putting a resort wear kind of swimwear thing out there like that and then um I don't know what I did the next year I might have did like a small little show and then I did uh, IDRS which was like a big step for me because I thought like that was cool like at least I'm feeling acknowledged like because I feel like if you do IDRS it means that you're like you know one of the good designers like in Seattle it's like a you know because now they don't accept on everybody and it's like I don't know and it got a lot of like press because of that and that was fun and then um I don't know what I've done since then just been oh yeah the the fashion is art stuff so uh i did the swimwear collection for idrs and that was kind of a crazy experience it was like the first time like i've had a lot of criticism and like in a good way though like they're like bellevue is very different than seattle like bellevue they're not as artistically like express themselves you know what i mean like everything's very what's in style in the world is what's in style there you know and like whatever brand does that's what it's very kind of corporate and just different than seattle so they wanted my brand to look at i mean it was really good for me it helped me like think about like more numbers and like you know how you would go about market something and getting like the line sheets and just getting everything ready because i don't have any training I just sew and kind of like put it out there and I've just managed to make something of myself. But this was the first thing that made me look at all my faults and like the business side of it. And then, I don't know, it did kind of make me a little depressed after that, like to be honest, for like, you know, a little bit. And then I started doing the fashion is art stuff for my own creativity because that like, it was good, but that's not what I want to do. I don't want to make the same thing. And like, it's, it's like took me and kind of like muted it down. And so when I did the fashion is art, it was like me, like letting it go and like doing like whatever I want and expressing myself. And that was really cool. So now I was working on my second fashion is art collection, but then this whole quarantine stuff happened. And now, I mean, I'm looking at it now, but I can't like show anybody and I still have to finish it, but I'm just like taking a break because everybody needed masks. So that's been crazy. Been busy making masks. So yeah, that's kind of my story. Some of it. Well, that's very, very cool. And um, I did actually happen to check in with uh, David Bailey, um, I think a few weeks back, maybe it was a little longer. And um, yeah, Fashion is Art has been uh, officially postponed indefinitely. And uh, they yeah. haven't been looking at the fall. And so whether or not that uh, uh, is allowed to happen or not, um, as a result of the state reopenings is still kind of up in the air. And um, yeah, we'll have to see. I think they were saying like November or March, like depending on like what happens but still that's a while like, yeah and for you as a designer that's still and i mean assuming of course that people were still going to have a, a, any kind of an adherence to a fashion calendar that would that would be a a, a critical misstep uh, from your perspective because everything that you would need to produce um in your world is very timely and revolves around getting things out in a particular uh, particular season well, i think for me it's just that like this collection was like saying something and I like to be like ahead of the time 
and I'm always thinking of like what brands are currently doing and then plus the future. Like for some reason, I always seem to be right in tune of what's going on. Like I haven't connected at all, all the dots yet, but like I know what's cool and like I usually have something to say. So like what I wanted to say for this collection and like the things that I like, it would have been really cool to do it when you know, in when it was supposed to happen, because I had so much, I think it would have been so relevant. And so, you know, it would have made a lot of sense. But now doing that same thing in November, it makes me rethink it. Like, what do I want to say now? Like, I kind of, because there's so much has gone on since then. To For, for me, it's like missing, you know, it was a little disappointing, because I'm missing my time, you know, like fashion moves so quick. And my inspiration goes so quick. If I'm into something, I want to do it right then. And then I'm on to the next thing. So I'm having to put this to the side and then focus on other things. But now I'm going to have to get back in that headspace and go back to it. So that part of it gets difficult. So. I can definitely feel your pain, as can everyone else in your position. This has been, and it sort of leads me to my next question, which is um, a slightly different topic. But how have you been managing during this, this sort of the pause that we're all on with the pandemic? And um yeah, just to put that out there, generally speaking, and then and then I'll have some follow up questions here in a second. Um, I actually surprisingly have been doing really good. I don't leave the house a lot anyway, so I'm usually home. Like I only go out to go to the grocery store or like the kids' school, or if there's like an important fashion event, or like if I want to like make a look and like go out just to show my look. Like, like that's usually the only reason I go out is like, I just want to, I made this and like, I need it. I want to go out and show it to the world at some point. So I've been okay. Uh, I guess I've switched gears a little bit. I'm not working on just whatever I wanted to make. And I started actually like making a bunch of masks. I started making a bunch of masks for uh, a model's mom that I know that's a nurse. And she said she was wearing the same paper mask for like two weeks. So I started first making masks for her hospital and then I drove down there and dropped those off. And then I made them all for my family and friends. And then I sent a bunch to my nurse aunt to Sherry. She's out of the state. And uh, so I started doing that first. And then I started making more fashionable ones to sell and then putting those out there online. And then everybody wanted masks. and It was just crazy. And I've been really busy. And finally, I tried to take a break from social media. I don't know. It might have been like two weeks now. I don't know. But it was just a lot. It's a lot of pressure, like every day, orders, orders, orders. And then my kids like started online school. So now I have to like really pay attention and like help them get their homework done. And it's just a lot. For a while, like I was so busy doing mass and my house was a mess. Everything like that was taking priority. But now like I have to switch gears to like take letting like me and my family take priority for a little bit. So yeah, but I've been doing okay. It's, 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 I don't know. It's okay for me. I don't feel like I'm missing anything now. Like normally everybody's out doing something and I'm seeing everybody on social media going to these events, doing stuff. And I'm like feeling like, ah, like I wish I was out doing something, but now everybody's doing the same thing. So I don't know. I feel like we're all on equal playing grounds <laughs> in a way, like all the content that we put out. It's like, I don't know. I feel good making my own content. Like everything I put out is just me, like my lighting, my camera, my makeup, my stuff, you know? So it's fun to put out stuff. I don't feel the pressure of having to like have a big photo shoot and have everything be so perfect when I put it on social media. Like now, I, I don't know, you know, like I could put more real stuff on there and I feel like people are more accepting of it because that's what everybody's doing. So that's nice. And then TikTok has been keeping me pretty busy too. I like making those. Those are cool. Cause then I can make like cool creative ideas in like a very short amount of time without any money. Like I don't need, I already have a bunch of wardrobe. I could do my own makeup. Normally before that, if I had a creative idea, I would have to call models over, get makeup, hair, like figure it all out. And it's a big coordination just for this one thing. So a lot of stuff doesn't happen. Like I have notebooks full of ideas that just don't happen. So with TikTok, I could just do them all myself in one day. So that's fun. That's been keeping me busy too. Well, we actually just featured your, uh, I think several of your uh, TikTok videos on the Seattle Fashion Collective um, social media. I forget which one off the top of my head, but uh, I was really excited when I came across your TikTok channel. I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a, an old fella, which is maybe obvious by all the white in my beard now, but, <laughs> um, but I'm loving this TikTok thing. It's a really interesting and a creative and expressive way. And it's just very short videos. And uh, I came across yours and immediately followed it. I was like, Oh my God, this is, this is just absolutely amazing. It allows you to express a side of creativity that I think is, is 
it, it's not that it's absent in fashion. It's just like you were saying, the production, when people think about the production, it becomes prohibitive. And having the immediacy for you to, to ideate, to have just an idea and then produce it, pump it out yeah. on your terms, on your schedule, when it works for you and your family, I think is just a marvelous idea. And, yeah. uh, and I did have a question sort of just sort of in general about motherhood and being a parent and having kids and being a fashion designer and being bivocational in that way. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's the priority of being a family. That's a 24 seven job. And, uh, you know, I was just curious, how do you find that balance? And especially now that the, that the kids are home all the time, um, finding that balance and that discipline and making sure schooling and education happens while having the outlet for your artistics, uh, your artistic side and your creativity. Yeah. Um, well, everybody's different, but for me, um, I don't know. I feel like as a woman, there's like a lot of pressure. Like you have to do everything, like, you know, be a good mom and then have a house clean, like make sure you look good. Like I have dinner for my husband, like also work on my career and have goals. Like there's so many things. And I feel like I can't, or, you know, for me, I can't do all of them all the time, but whenever I'm doing one of them, I can give like all of myself to it. Cause if I try to give a little bit of myself, to all these things. Like, I feel like I'm never doing anything a hundred percent. So I, my house gets messy sometimes. Like I'll do TikToks all day, one day, if I want to, I mean, I still make food for the kids here and there, but I may, I don't, I don't know. It's just the next day, maybe I'll clean all day. Or like, sometimes I don't make dinner for a couple of days and we eat out. Or sometimes I'll make like crazy gourmet meals. Cause I'm in the mood for it. Like just whatever. I just allow myself the freedom to be able to do whatever I want to do that day. I mean, so for me, I guess that, I mean, I don't know, I have my husband and stuff, so I don't have to like go out and like work and be busy like that, but I'm home taking care of the kids. But I guess, yeah, I don't know. I just have to allow myself to not feel guilty about the things that I'm not doing right then. Cause like nobody can do anything perfect. If you do, if you start going all the way on one subject, like a teeter totter, the other one's going to go down. And so I, you know, I just I can't go full force one way for like too many days in a row. You know, so I, I'm getting better at like evening it all out and trying to do multiple things in a day. That's still like sh struggle for me, but I do it. I just don't feel like bad about it because I feel like I'm doing a good job. So, I, don't know. Well, I think that's, really that's how I do. Yeah, I, I think what you just said is very important. And the idea that, you know, there are a bunch of burdens and there is this external pressures, but not judging yourself and finding... I really love how you put it where you said, you know, whatever the task is in front of you at that moment, you're putting a hundred percent of yourself in. I think that's a, that's a very great way of doing it. It's a very great, uh, great way of looking at it, finding balance. And mm -hmm. um, I've been talking quite a lot uh, with a lot of people lately on the topic of creativity. And um, I'd like to kind of go back. I'll be jumping sort of chronologically along the timeline a bit, but um, creatively speaking, just sort of going, dialing back the clock and, um, you know, what were, what were your really early creative influences? Um, I think just looking at magazines and like the fashion spreads at the end of the magazines that were like all like fantasy and like editorial, like those type of things. Like, and me, I think just me wanting to be different, like, and even now, like, it's the same thing. Like if I go back to my roots, I, uh, my mom worked, well, my, my parents broke up when I was in like third grade and my mom had to work three jobs to support us four kids. So she was like never home. And my oldest brother was a teenager, so he could technically babysit us, but we kind of like did our own thing. And I was the only girl. And like, I felt like I was constantly looking for something. Like I never fit in at all. So I think just looking for something like I, when I was younger, I'd make paper dolls and like just dressing different was a way for me I guess to express myself, like I just, I don't know, that's, and I didn't fit in anywhere. So I wanted to make something of my own. So I don't know. And just, I guess different things inspire me. When I was younger, it was just being fashionable. I wanted to look different than everybody else, but in a cool way. Like I wanted to look like, I don't know, not from that town. And so I dress so crazy all the time. And then as I got older, I started making like more of the swimwear, like prior to my fashion weeks, I think it was just, like wanting to be this attractive girl and like, cause I was young and I favored, I, I got pride on the way that I looked. 
So like, I don't know, I, I wanted to make sexy swimwear and have girls look more like a Victoria's Secret model. And like, because that's just what was in my head at the time. And then now as I'm getting older, like, I don't care that much about how I look. Like it doesn't, I don't care if people tell me that I'm pretty or whatever. Like I care about like my, my accomplishments, you know? And like when people tell me like they're amazed or that I'm so inspiring or like, you know, the stuff that I do, like that stuff makes me feel really good. So now that's more my inspiration throughout the last few couple of years, like the last years, like the girl's hair has been more up and more avant-garde poses, like less like sexy and more like, you know, just, it just changed a little bit with my life. Cause my inspiration is like, I guess my own things, you know, like what I'm going through at the time and like my thoughts. So like the fashion is art one from the last collection was like more of me expressing just how I feel about like my mental health and like doing something more dark, you know, and just, I don't know that like that. So, and I'm touching more on that again. Like I lately I've been getting more into my feelings and like using that to express like in my fashion. And that's different. Cause I don't know a lot of people are doing that. Like a lot of people make clothes and they're pretty dresses or, you know, there's a market for all these things. And I don't make clothes because I'm trying to make money even though my husband probably would love it if I could care more about making money, but I just want to make stuff. Like, I don't know. I just want people to know my name. I want to make these cool things that are different because I want to express myself. Like I've always just, like I said, since I was younger, I've had this need to be accepted and to be like, to prove myself, you know, or like to have somebody value me. So now I work so hard. I feel like on this brand because I just want to be valued. Like I just want to make it, you know? If that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the validation can be can be addictive, just like any drug. And it, you know, there comes a time I think where every artist has to reach a point where they decide what really matters to them. And I think kind of how you described your definition of beauty previously being more about the the very the the sort of hyper sexualized uh, form and the Victoria's Secret model. And then you sort of you began shedding those layers as as you grew older and you realized, okay, here's here's where I'm at and this is what matters to me now. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of the uh, when when we sort of peel away those onion layers uh, for what our why is, why do we do this thing in the first place? That's where we find the most stimulating and the most powerful source of of drive and passion, not just to be successful, whether it's financial or the accolades but actually do something that matters and do something that really connects with people and really helps them maybe see themselves in a way that they've never seen themselves before, in particular as it pertains to, to sort of beauty and, and, and wellness. And um, not to get on a rant here, but, uh, yes. but that kind of leads me to, to my question. And, um, you know, how would you define uh, beauty sort of big picture and then sort of working more towards the, to the, to the, the micro, the granular, um, you know, who is it that you design for in your swimwear and in your other lines? Um, so first to just find beauty. Um, just something, I guess, that catches your eye. And it's like, it could be different. There could be dark beauty, like something that is really sad or, you know, that's also beautiful. Like, I don't know. Like, there's just different ways of putting it. I don't know. Like, I used to be more about the woman's shape being beautiful, and I still feel that way. I love a woman's body. I feel like it's like art. Every, you know, the the curves and the roundness, and it's like that's what I still design for to this day. Like, I usually draw like the on my croquis or it's like the naked kind of form, and I'll look at that, and then I'll draw lines and like start making my sketches to enhance that like I don't want to take away from that if you look at my I'm not going to make something that's like super bulky and it's just not my woman you know my woman still wants to feel feminine and sexy and powerful but more of in a different way now you know the, the woman I designed for now it could be anywhere from someone that's like you know 14 up to like I've got a woman in her 50s that's a client of mine like I just uh I still design only for women. I do need to think more about what my man would be. And I have been thinking about that too, because I struggle with like the man that I'm attracted to. Do you know what I mean? And then like the kind of man that I think is a man. But then if I made clothes, what would a Jersey Virago customer male like look like? Do you know what I mean? So I've been trying to think about that more and separate the two 
because they're different, you know, and so I've been thinking about it. So I do plan on doing more with doing something with menswear in the next coming years just to do it. I just need to start thinking about that. Um, but the woman that I designed for, I would say it's just like a power bitch in a way, <laughs> not to cast or anything, but like somebody who is wants to be not the center of attention, but like when they walk in the room, everybody's like, wow. And I know all the designers say that, but I feel like with my clothing, it actually is like, they do look different. Like I don't want to make something that is already in the store. I mean, I may make something like that for myself, but I'm not going to sell it and put my name on it and say, this is Jersey Farrago. Like I may make something for myself that's, you know, out there just because I don't have the money to buy it. But um, yeah, I don't know. Well, if I could offer any encouragement, it would be that please, please do uh, produce something for, that was actually specifically going to be my request slash encouragement menswear line. But, uh, and as it pertains to the swimwear specifically, I have been talking with uh, uh, Heidi Fish, for example, and, and several others in the area. And, uh, you know, a, a little bit of men's representation, I think goes, goes quite a long way, just, just to put that out there. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at clothing, uh, a bit more, you know, traditional wear. I know that you said that that's, that's not necessarily where you want to put your focus and your creativity. Um, but I absolutely friggin' love the way you style yourself. <laughs> I think you have a marvelous sense of style. And I think that, um, you know, to editorialize, I, I, I would strongly encourage that you consider that as well as you move forward. And, and, and whether you have the time and, and the wear and, you know, the ability to do it. Um, notwithstanding it, I think that the world would only benefit from your world yeah. view um, and your sense of style. So I'll get off. I mean, I have, that's like one of the goals, I guess, would be like one dream of mine would be like, yeah, to have, I mean, it, it's not a dream, but it is going to be in the future is that I am going to get um, like my pattern, either get my patterns into like solid, like digital patterns, which either I'm going to have to learn how to do them myself or hired, hire a pattern maker so I can get an actual digital pattern. And then I can start looking into either like small batch manufacturing or like something like that. Like this was kind of the road that I was going down when I did IDRS. Like I was on that trajectory just to, to go to that point. And then I just kind of fell off and got depressed and kind of just been doing the artsy stuff. But I do plan on getting back on to that and then getting some solid like products that I don't have to keep sewing myself. Cause it's not that much that I don't mind. Like I just don't want to sew them myself. I don't want to make a regular pair of pants, like make the same thing over and over and over again. And because I'm self-taught, I really don't know the whole business side of it. I'm more of like a hustler and I just kind of made it on my own. But to, to the whole business side kind of scares me, but I do plan on doing that. I mean, my son's six and my daughter's 10. So they're, they're starting to get older where I'm starting to be able to do more. And that was always the plan is as they get when they get older that I will go more into the business side of it. But until then I was just still trying to go on the same path, like build a brand. And that way, when I finally do have a product, I do have a following and then I'll have all these people that will want to buy it. So I didn't want to just do nothing. So I mean, I don't know. I am always working on something, but that's the plan eventually is to have it in manufacturing, maybe able to sell online or even have like a store. Uh, like I thought about this before having a store, that'd be fun. Like, where I would have my own brand, Jersey Virago, things that I make, but then I could also like pick things, you know, cause you say like my style, like I could, just like a regular store would have like their style, you know, and I'd have like a Jersey Virago store and that'd be like the cool place. And I think that'd be really cool, but just a dream. Or I think it'd be a bigger dream too, would have like a huge, like Andy Warhol style, like, like warehouse type thing and like have a whole bunch of people like creating and we would just like be making content all day together. And like, that's like my dream when I'm older, like where I can buy a space and just like have a bunch of artists and everybody just like making stuff. That'd be really cool. But I just can't do it. <laughs> well, a couple of quick follow-ups. The, the first you mentioned about uh, sort of digital pattern making and digital design techniques. And uh, there is a 3D application, which um, I actually have just downloaded because I want to learn about this stuff too. I believe it's called um, CLO. I think it's C-L-O 3D. Uh, don't quote me on that. I'll, I'll send you a link, but um, it's actually really easy to get into. It's, it's, it's just like, um, I'm trying to think of the other 
there's like 3D programs and a lot of them seem kind of bonkers, but this one looks pretty straightforward. And there's like 37 videos that teach you how to use it. So you can just watch the videos and I'm already kind of, kind of figuring out where things go along. Yeah. Um, and also Devin Yan, who, um, whom I, th I believe you know as well, mm -hmm. um, is like super, like, like crazy good at that stuff too. And so um, I did want to just say that, there is a, a very strong and vibrant community of people in the area that, uh, you know, that love you and that support you and um, have expertise. So if there's, you know, don't ever feel like you're on your own because there's a ton yeah. of really smart brainiac people who know exactly about all of this stuff. And, uh, and you know, they're more than happy to help. And um, especially now, and especially during this really, you know, super crazy troubling time that we're all in um, the business side of things is uh, there's, I'm, I'm happy to connect you with people. There's just so many amazing, smart, talented people. And mm -hmm. a lot of them don't have much to do right now. So um, anyway, so there's that. But um, Just like my creative brain to focus. Because as you know, like people that are creative and artistic, they're like, they'd, it'd be good if they had a business person and then those people could do that together. And then this one is creative and this one, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like Valentina, or you know what I mean? Like you always have the creative person and then the other one. So I've just... I don't know. It's hard to, to do those things, but I just, whenever I set my mind to something, I do it. I just need to make the decision to do it, which I haven't, but I will. Well, and, and again, when you do, there's a, there's a pretty big community here that, that not only wants to see you succeed, but is willing to help. And um, whatever, you know, whatever Seattle fashion collective as it is now is um, it's sort of gone through a lot of changes. I started this uh, several, you were actually on the cover of our first magazine issue uh, in 2000. 16 or 17. SS 17, like the collections. Yeah, I think technically it was 2016, but it was, yeah, it was the spring, summer 17 uh, season. Um, and so it's gone through quite a lot of change in the meantime. And now here we are, you know, 2020. And um, it's, it's, it's really more about building community. And it's kind of like what you're saying. It's a, it's, it's kind of turning into a digital warehouse where a bunch of people can just get together and, share their stuff and talk about things and where the, you know, eventually a point of sale can happen. And mm -hmm. um, Renegade Craft Fair, for example, I think is in San Francisco and I'm pretty sure they're actually doing one now this weekend. Um, this is May 28th that we're recording this. Um, on the 29th and 30th, they're doing a digital craft fair and um, they, it, it's probably too late for people to, to, to come on board as a vendor, but it'd be a great way to experience it and just kind of see what's happening in the digital world and how these sort of dots can get cre uh, connected mm -hmm. um, with design and commerce and, you know, going direct to consumer is such a huge thing and it's only going to increase, you know, no, no matter what your omni channel sort of marketing streams look like moving forward, the direct to consumer is the path forward for independent fashion. Um, you know, we've seen that CFDA has been talking about it. Vogue has been talking about it. Everyone's talking about it. Uh, Nordstrom is, heavily heavily investing in that area right now so um anyway i'll stop editorializing but i'm just really excited to share this information with you so I, please be encouraged there's a lot of cool stuff happening um but sort of shifting gears towards your story if we can stop talking about me for a second um back to you i'd love to hear about um sort of your what was the uh, the the sort of because you've been published i believe in vogue and gq um and and I, I think a few times um but over the course of years which experiences stand out to you some of the most remarkable i think you were also featured in a couple of music videos i know i saw one of them recently um yeah i was i had some stuff on america's next top model too that was pretty cool that was a highlight for sure um i would say is what sticks out for would be the first thing would be like the Seattle fashion week was the first time I felt like I made a full collection and I felt like I took a step up. Um, IDRS was one of the biggest kind of local things that kind of, you know, made me feel like accepted a little bit more. And I felt a little bit more validated because uh, I don't know. I always consider myself an underdog. Like, I don't know if it's just part of me and my story like I just put myself in that category and then it like fuels my fire to go forward like if everybody was okay with me and I was accepted or if I thought I was then I wouldn't keep trying so hard to be accepted so I don't know if I'm I probably am accepted but in my mind I just keep thinking that I need to work harder you know so I don't know it's just part of my fuel I guess uh, but what was the question again sorry 
Well, just a quick follow up. I hope that your drive to succeed is is directly, uh, you know, has a causal relationship with what it is that you want to say and put out in the world. And uh, yeah, and yes, you are absolutely accepted and validated. And just showing up and saying, "Here I am." That's all the you know. That's all that's required. You don't have to prove anything to anyone. Yeah, well, it's more like family stuff. Like you know, my dad wasn't around. I still don't even talk to him. He's never even looked at my fashions because he used to see bikinis and he was like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. And so, I don't know, part of me, it's just at a spite, you know, like it's not, like I, like I said, it's just my fuel. I'm like, I just want to prove myself. Like, I just want to do so good to where I'm like really big one day and then my dad comes back and I'll be like, who? You know what I mean? I'd be like, no. So it's just petty, but it's not, I know that people accept me, but like I said, I just put myself in that, that box for just reasons. But it's okay. That's how people are, though. And, like, if you don't have the best upbringing, it, like, fuels you to have a better life. So You definitely can. And it's sort of a best-case scenario is that it does. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. But for, you know, for, for those who, who are able to be in that space and, and, and choose to have a different path in life, yes, it can be very motivating, for sure. I, I share a very similar story as far as that goes, um, mm-hmm. which I'm happy to get into when I am being interviewed. But for the time <laughs> being... Um, so, you know, the question was kind of, uh, it was sort of less about accolades and really more about, you know, what was the most, it sounds like runway was is just a really fun experience for it. It's really, it fills your tank. It's, it's what's vibrant. It makes you feel alive. And Yeah. Being creative. I like all oh, my fashion videos that I, that I've done over the years. Like those are my favorite things to do. Like the videos I used to do with, uh, Dorian was his name, uh, and so I would just get the outfits and the models and he would kind of just shoot the scenes and we would just come up with something on our own. And it was really cool. So like fashion videos, I like guess just being creative and like whether it's making something that's creative, like a runway show where I get to pick all the looks and the models and the makeup and, you know, like the whole process of me like thinking about it. And um, yeah, I think just being in it and like feeling like I'm a fashion designer. Cause like, I've always just like faked it till you make it kind of like, I, like I said, I just started making stuff and I'm like, okay, this is my brand, you know, here's my clothes. And then, you know, I'm a fashion designer. And so for me, like coming up with the collection and like sketching it all out, pinning it on my walls, like, you know, taking the months to like create it, having the show, you know, and then seeing the pictures out of it, like the whole process is really rewarding to me. It makes me feel like, I'm like alive and I'm doing something, you know, and it's like, I need to do that like every year creatively to like get my creativity out. Um, but yeah, the videos, I think I really like doing those. Um, and the runway shows, I really like doing those too. But now I'm just at the point where I've done some of the big local shows. Like I don't want to spend the money to do Vancouver Fashion Week or Fashion NXT yet because I just don't feel like I'm at a place where I am I have a product that I'm ready for buyers anyway. So I don't know. And people usually do those shows because you want to get to buyers or you want to like uh, like propel your brand up, you know, to the next level. And I'm just like feeling like, I feel like I'm already cool. Like I don't really want to do those shows at the moment. And I really like Seattle and I wish there was more things here locally, you know, for, for designers here. Like I know they have some shows in Seattle, but they're not, I feel like they don't, you know, like Metropolitan Fashion Week is nice, but I feel like they don't, they don't have local designers here that they, they know what's going on around here and they get those designers and their new collections, you know, like there's, it's not that. And they have their benefit shows that they do every year and stuff like that. But there's no, I don't know. I wish there was something in Seattle where people could show their stuff every year. So I do like the, the, um, the fashion is art. That's really nice. I feel like I don't really want to do the cars and couture's because it's just maybe not what I want to do right now. I want to do the more artistic stuff. So, I don't know. I don't know if I'm getting off topic, but once I start talking, it just... No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Actually, that is perfectly on topic, because you know, like you mentioned, the, the, what's, what's really interesting about fashion in Seattle really is the diversity, and even the, de- even the definition is very diverse. And, uh, and the syntax means a lot of things to a lot of people. And when you say fashion, it can mean slow fashion where we don't adhere to a fashion calendar. And it could mean sustainable fashion where we only use certain materials. And it can mean 
uh, really avant-garde cool stuff, which is more about the experience. And it can mean for others, commercial fashion, where I'm mass producing 50,000 units of a thing. And uh, for it's a, it's a very, because of the diversity, it, become, it becomes quite difficult to, uh, to standardize. And it becomes quite difficult to say, here's one cool venue for, you know, a rubber stamp for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, it becomes quite difficult for that. It, 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 the diversity of the designers and the diversity of the, of the, uh, the products require a diverse approach mm-hmm. and, you know, and a steady hand and consistency and uh, that user generated feedback where, you know, you're really listening to people, hearing what consumers have to say and hearing how, you know, what designers need and how we can sort of connect these dots in a way that really solves problems. And, um, there are people that are trying to work on that. They were doing a, a lot towards that end. And then the coronavirus happened and it really, a lot of businesses are, they're not sure if they're going to come back. And so it's um, because of just how the last few months has played out, all of the entire local fashion industry is, is functionally and figuratively hemorrhaging right now. Um, and they're just being offered band-aids. They're it's just band-aids to put on hemorrhages. Um, we really need big, big, big time solutions. And the path forward towards those solutions is digital. It's our first step and it's really our only connection point. And so to do a runway, anybody can do it. I have been asking people to do this for years and I think now it's, it's a bit more acceptable. We're seeing bigger brands do it. Virtual runways, digital runways, mm-hmm. setting up your own camera, getting some friends, doing it in your apartment, doing it, doing it on the street, doing it in the subway. You know, if, if if you can with social distancing, um, <laughs> find you know it's it's not about do I have two hundred fifty thousand dollars to get a giant venue, it's about what really great experience can I create for the people that are going to be really delighted to see or to be a part of this experience, and for you if it's about you know if people really love you on TikTok and they're really following you on social media. Why not just create an IGTV runway and, and say, hey, tune in Friday at 3.30 or whatever, and we're going to do a runway experience. And I would love to be able to help out with something like that. I think that maybe that's a skill set that I can apply. But I think um, it's the, the power is really more in the hands of the designer and the independent fashion producer. Um, you don't have to wait for a gatekeeper. Um, mm-hmm. And part of what I'm doing with Seattle Fashion Collective is really dismantling this centralization and this feeling like we're a gatekeeper because we're not, I'm not. I'm just someone that's trying to be like a faucet. I'm just trying to allow stories to come out of the faucet and go where they're going to go. And that's, you know, that's the the opportunity that we have and the value here because the power is in your hands. And mm-hmm. um, all that to say, being able to monetize it's a different story, but it's, it's possible too. Um, but again, I apologize. I'm getting on a rant. Getting back, no, to you, back to you, just just a point of encouragement. I think that you know, a, there's there's just a ton of ways for you to connect to people and um, and connect that to your specific areas of passion. And if your TikTok is any indication, then a digital path forward. It, it looks like that's the most promising promising for you this time. It makes me the happiest lately, honestly. Like I, I don't know. Like lately, when I make TikToks, I'm just like alive and like I'm in the moment and I'm like looking on them. I do this video right now, and then I just have like a bunch of wigs now and lighting and backdrop. Like it's just really fun, and it makes me like happy to do those. I don't know. I wish I could just do the. Well, that's what I've been doing lately. I took a break from Facebook, and now I'm just making TikToks and making like whatever I want and sewing and making a TikTok about it because it makes me happy and I need to like refuel before I go back to like anything else so and it's hard to see everybody making masks on Facebook it is it's I know it is fine but I've been like making these masks since like 2016 even back when I did Seattle Fashion Week I had masks that I showed like at my um designer preview thing like when I got accepted then and so and I like to be different so I used to wear masks to events because it would I would just feel like different and it was part of my look you know and then I would try to sell them nobody wanted to buy them and then now some people did but now everybody's making them and that's great like I'm not that I just hard for me to look at you know because I do have a mental disorder and like so sometimes I have to be careful what I put in front of me like what I let occupy my space like in my brain so like you know if I find myself looking at how 
other people doing really good. And then it'll start, I'll start comparing myself. And like, I don't know, sometimes I just, like, I don't watch scary movies really anymore because they just don't make me, I don't know. I don't like those thoughts in my head. So I need to be careful of like what I surround myself with, which is also why I don't go out very much. So Facebook is, but TikTok's great. I don't really know anybody on there. Well, now I do because I've been on there since 2018. So like nobody was on there back then that I knew. It was all just like random people, but now everybody's on there. So I actually had to go back and make a bunch of my videos private because I showed my new collection on there, <laughs> but nobody like locally saw it. So whoever did see it, like they got a sneak peek, but I had to like private a bunch of videos just because I was like, mm, I don't know. Everybody's jumping on there now. So I better take it down. <laughs> It's probably a good idea, especially if you're trying to position yourself. Uh, yeah, it, it's definitely wise. But, uh, you know, you, you've always been someone that's been innovative. And it's something that um, not only comes across in your fashion work, but also in um, your own personal communications, your commun communication style. And um, the things that you, uh, uh, your because you had a Snapchat channel as well a while ago, didn't you? <laughs> Yeah, I just delete all the phone, all the apps off my phone when I want to take a break. Because if I open my phone, I'll immediately go to my social media. Like, it's a brain pattern that, like, I have to change my brain pattern. So I will just delete it off my phone for that. Like, right now, Facebook, Instagram is not on my phone. Snapchat, not on my phone. But when I get, when I decide to go back, like, and actually go back, then I'll put them all back on. And then I'll make my posts. But I was just getting crazy amounts of mask orders like i've sold so hundreds of masks just off instagram and facebook like just me posting like every time i made a mask i'd put it in my story you know and then so it was like free advertising because i have four thousand like nine hundred and ninety five friends or something like i keep it under five thousand so that i can accept people you know so because i don't want to be like oh they can accept friends and then plus i have my other page my business page which only has like a thousand of my friends that like it so that's a whole nother people so like all these people i'm constantly like putting my product in their face like on my on their stream on their story so then they're like okay finally like how much is your mask oh i want that one like one finally catches their eye so it is kind of crazy like i don't know just not having to spend any money on advertising like just just networking and having all these friends and this brand that I built up, like I get a little taste of what it would be like if I could just keep pumping out product and making money. Like I was doing really good, but it was just overwhelming for me because I'm not used to being so busy like that. It'd be nice. I mean, but and then with all this stuff going on, I can't hire someone to sober me with the quarantine and everything. So I'm like, I don't know. It's hard to sew masks over and over again. I actually switched my entire studio around when I, because I used to sew in the other part of the room and then I moved my closet. And so I'm in a completely different area now because I could not sit in that same chair and sew the same shape. It was just ridiculous. But I did it, but it was a lot. <laughs> Uh, well, just a quick follow-up. If you were looking for uh, for people to help, there are uh, sewists that are out there that um, that you actually can connect with, and um, yeah. there is a there. Yeah, it's. Um, I'd be happy to make a connection uh, for you as well. That you know, if if you would like to move forward in a particular area, you absolutely can hire them, and totally legal, totally legit. You know, um, you, you can follow protocols. You can do deliveries, and you know, things can work out for you. And, um, so that is a path forward. I definitely think taking a break is wise. And um, what uh, you, the, the, the point I wanted to make earlier was that because social media is such a, a, a rich connection point for you, it's, it's a really big touch point for um, not just people to follow, to be entertained, but for customers to connect with you. And having all of these different, you know, Snapchat, I don't even know if Vines are a thing. I'm technically a late adopter. Cats I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know, I don't know, probably buying all that stuff is just everybody's on TikTok now. Yeah, well, you you just sort of instinct instinctively known, you know, where's the next thing uh, going to happen, like all throughout the course of your journey. Yeah. And um, it, it's a very uncanny instinctual uh, uh, skill that you have, skill set. And whether it's skill or whether it's instinct, the fact is you have it. And I'm curious if maybe you could speak to that uh, for just a second. What, uh, you know, what... What excites you about a new social media opportunity and what things stand out to you and say, oh, this is going to be a thing? Um, I don't know. I don't know what the next thing in social media is going to be. Uh, 
I don't know. I heard, I thought it was Google or someone was trying to do their own TikTok, like a version of that. I don't know if it was Google or what. I, I'm not sure, but some big company and they actually have the rights to all the music. So I don't know, maybe something like that. We'll see. But uh, I don't know. I just, I just like social media. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, and I don't know. I just go like instinctively what I think is going to be cool next. And I like to like, on Instagram, like when I got on Instagram, I don't like to follow a bunch of people that I'm friends with. I went on there strategically to make my feed my inspiration page. So like I follow um, like designers or like Sita Ablan, who's like Rihanna's muse. And like, so I've been following like designers and stylists and like their muses, you know? So I feel like I'm getting similar inspiration that they're getting at the same time. But then those people are always working like six months, year, like ahead of time. So I feel like, I don't know, I try to think like that too, like ahead of time, what's going to be cool. Like, you know, I don't know. It takes, th it takes things a while to catch on here. You know, like I was wearing the black thin chokers like before everybody else was wearing them. And then I stopped wearing them when everybody else wore them. So I was like, yeah, but I knew that all the cool people were online, like were wearing them at that time, but it just hadn't caught on yet because it takes a minute. So, and then TikTok, I don't even know. It wouldn't have been like Gary V. Um, do you know who he is? Yeah. Gary. Yeah. So I think I might have been watching him years ago and he was talking about TikTok because I watched like a lot of TED Talks and I like, I don't know. I like to watch a lot of stuff where I'm learning. Like I like to read a lot of books. Not, not, not a lot of books. Like, um, like, have you read The Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's one of my favorite books. And then like, I started reading like the rich dad, poor dad and like a bunch of just books that I feel like humans should read, you know, like they're good to just know. And so I don't know. I feel like I'm just in tune with things too. I try to stay in a positive energy and I do believe that we're all connected. So, you know, if someone has an idea out there and they think it and they put it out to the universe, they can get picked up by somebody else. Like, that's weird, but it, it is, you know, like if you're in tune to kind of what's going on and sometimes things just pop in my head and I just write it down. Like, I don't know. Well, there's a lot in there. I think there's a, there's a lot that people can latch on to and, um, you know, staying connected and, and really believing that if you put something out in the universe, it's not going into a void. It does come back, I think is a really... Mm -hmm. Uh, is a really timely and important message, um, especially now that we all have the time to invest in things, um, hopefully ourselves being the first, but of course our businesses and our families um, as well. I don't know, just getting back to normal. It'd be nice to go out with the kids, like see my mom, go out to an event, you know, just be around people, like, I don't know, share energy. Like it's just everybody's stuck at home in their own world and like their own energy and like their own stuff. And like, I would just like to, you know, have the option to go out and be part of society if I want to. And also the line at Joanne's is like an hour long. I had to get thread the other day and I had to sit there for an hour. And I was like thinking if I have to go back again, I'm going to bring like a lawn chair, like, you know, how people like camp out. And I, I was like, I'm not doing this again. So it'd be nice to be able to go shopping, you know. Well, we're definitely going to get there. So we're moving in that direction. And, uh, you know, I, I did hear about a Joanne's location uh, closing down. And it, it seems like they're going to close permanently. So um, I haven't had word on as far as local sourcing because it's just very, very difficult to source things, um, especially if you're a local and independent uh, maker. Um, everyone's having to uh, reassess where they're sourcing their raw materials, whether it's coming from China or whether it's coming from uh, uh, British Columbia up in Canada, um, paying different tariffs, paying different you know taxes just to get things in the country now. And um, on the sourcing side of things, just to quickly follow up, have you had any slowdowns as far as getting access to your materials other than, you know, of course- Yeah, that? yeah, I just go to Joanne's for just to get thread usually. And then if, if I walk by something and it like catches my eye, I might buy a few yards or whatever just to have. But um, yeah, my swimsuit fabric that I usually get comes from the UK. So like they might have a, a warehouse here or something, but I can't get it. Like they're not even open. So that sucks. Like this, uh, like this cloud mask, like this cloud print that I had, like everybody loved these. And I only had enough to make like maybe five of them. And I just can't get any more of this. And like my black swimwear fabric, they... I can't get it because I use this fabric because it's like nicer quality than the Joann's one because they actually use Lycra instead of, it's like a, 
yeah, I like the polyester blend and the Joann's one's like a nylon spandex blend. So it's just, it's way more stretchy and I don't like it. So the fabric that I use, I can't get. So I've been having to like try different things for my strings. Luckily I'm not making swimsuits, but like I use the same string technique on my masks. So I've been having to try different things. So, I mean, it, I mean, I guess it's nice. It makes me learn to do like different materials. Sometimes I get stuck in my same old ways and when I have to try something new, I learn from it. But I mean, I guess lucky for me, I don't have like some product online that everybody's so used to this one particular fabric or thing, you know, or print or whatever. So I haven't had too much trouble. And I have a huge room upstairs full of fabric and things that I've collected over the years. And I'm just so busy that I like haven't been able to get into them. So now I can actually like cut into the fabric. So that's nice. Kind of like if you like don't go to the grocery store and you just eat up all the food you have at home, you know, and you're like, oh, that was nice. Like, I feel like it's like that. Like I have so much projects at home and like so much fabric and I'm always like, I just forget about them and I'm just buying something new that now I'm like going through all my old stuff and it's like kind of nice, you know, in that sense. Oh, absolutely. And the scarcity of resources definitely makes us appreciate what we do have. Um, Times of lack definitely do that in more ways than one for sure. And uh, the last question that I had for you is, uh, it's kind of a kind of a big picture question, but um, you know, I am very curious if you had any kind of a message that you'd want to sort of put out into the universe right now, um, what would that be? And I'll, and I'll frame it just by saying, you know, I, this sounds morbid and I've been saying this a lot, but you know, kind of the way that I think is you know, if I was going to die tomorrow, you know, who would I reach out to today and what would I say? Is there, is there any, is there anything that I think would be important to say? Um, and if so, what would that be? I would say the most important thing to me is like just positive energy and like being a good person to me. Like, you know, like things are always happening around you that are bad. There's bad things on the news. Like you said, your neighbors are fighting. Like there's always something I could look online and get jealous about something. But like, if you keep yourself in a positive mind frame and just like enjoy life, whatever it is, like sometimes I'm feeling like I'm not having the most, you know, and I'm like upset that, you know, what I have is not enough. And then like the gratitude thing, I have to go back and like realize what I have, you know, because sometimes we're so busy with life that we don't appreciate what's actually in front of us, you know? So with this whole quarantine thing where we're all like having to look at what's in front of us, you know, and you should appreciate that because we do have a lot more than other people in the world, you know, like, I appreciate all the fabric that I have, you know, the little, whatever I have, I appreciate it. And now like having to talk to people, like, I feel like people are appreciating the connections more, you know, before it was like, Oh, hi. Like you don't appreciate seeing them, you know, and like having conversations and like sharing opinions and stuff like that. And I just feel like all worrying, like, isn't, you know, like people should just appreciate what they have. If you have like a day left to live, you know, like be happy and enjoy what's in front of you, your family, your loved ones, like, you know, your, whatever you love to do, you know, if you want to go swim all day, if you want to sew all day, you know, like you only get one life. And I would hate for someone to die with regret, 